And the title of this talk is, So You Want to Build a Security Lab? If you're not here for this talk, you're in the wrong room, and you probably need to go to one of the other rooms. <laughs> Just an FYI. All right, uh, my name is Jared Seitz. Um, as you know, I've been going to SEC KC for a while. I graduated. Um, you guys hearing that feedback too, or is it just me? <laughs> it happens, you're cool. Oh, are you sure? Yeah, it's, it's not cool. <laughs> I'll take your word for it. Um, I graduated in the Southern Illinois University of Carbondale. Um, they have like a, you know, the general information technology degree. Uh, lucky for me that they also have like a networking and security program. This is really awesome and really hands on. So like, we poked around, we set up, you know, Active Directory domains, and we pen tested against them, we had to set up Cisco switches, and all that stuff that I don't remember anymore because I haven't touched networking equipment since I graduated, <laughs> so keep that in mind, all you younger people that are graduating. How many, actually, how many are in college right now? Any? Hey, wow, quite a bit. So remember, everything you know now, you're going to use 1% of it, but you're going to get really good at that, and be awesome at your job, but you're going to forget the rest. Keep that in mind. <laughs> um, I interned with the Oklahoma State Information Security team. This was my, you know, first real world of hey, security is great. It's awesome. I want to like change the world. I want to tell people how to do security. Then I get an internship at a state department that's in charge of security, and I find out no, you're not, <laughs> because no one really wants to do security. They say they do, but it's hard work. Um, then after that, I got hired at a place called Cerner. I, have you guys heard of it? Oh, that's right. They're hosting this place this year, it's, they're awesome. But I was a system engineer and my main focus was dealing with Splunk. I left Cern about a year ago, started another company called Defense Point Security. They're actually based in DC, but I work remote now, so I get to sit at my apartment and work, or I get to fly and travel to the client side. So it's a pretty sweet gig, um, and I enjoy it. And uh, I'm also a certified Splunk consultant. Basically, whenever I go to sites, they, have, they either have a new Splunk instance or they have an old Splunk instance, and I help them get them up and running. Um, so, a lot of fun stuff, really enjoyed my job, and uh, let's get going. Um, so, what this talk will cover, uh, we're just going to go over the basics of like a security lab, home and work base. We're going to focus more on just like the pieces of the lab, like what you want to do and what you want to get. Um, and like, we'll go into like what you can use as well. Um, and another thing is like, where are you going to get your pieces? It will be different for home and work, some places you may not even think of, but uh, hopefully we'll go over that. And uh, other things like what you should watch out for, uh, sometimes there's different scams that go on, like we'll talk about that as well. Um, and then some, we'll go over a few examples, like once you have your lab up and running, like what can you do, like just a few simple scenarios, and basically it'll be what you want to like focus on. Are you networking, are you going to do a malware, pen testing? You just want to like find admin stuff and be a better blue teamer. Oof, we'll talk about that. Um, and then I gave a survey out back in March. Had a few people fill it out and they told me what they did and we'll go over that a little bit. And then you know any good talk that isn't well documented actually has a time filler. Um, that way we can actually fill our whole time slot. So when I'm like 30 minutes early and I look at my watch and there's still 30 minutes left, we can start talking about random stuff about labs and. Figure what you guys want and what you guys are doing as well. And then at the end, we got questions. So uh, let's get rocking. Um, so we're going to start with how to set up a home lab dealing with security. Um, so the big thing that you might be like, do you have a budget? Do you have money set aside that you're going to buy new hardware, new pieces, all that stuff? Or are you a broke college student and you just want to find whatever you can for as cheap as possible? Um, that will help focus on like, what is your goal. You may want to be like a super cool pen tester, but do you really need this, you know, eight thousand dollar supercomputer cloud that you know does everything when you know maybe a Raspberry Pi will work, or simple VMs on your own laptop? You got to think about that. Um, and then again, is it possible to use what you already have? So like, do you have a spare laptop even your working laptop? I don't know if you've noticed, but like CPUs haven't really been super powerful these past few years, and a laptop that's a few years old can still do pretty much what any laptop today can do. Now you got your RAM and stuff, and yada yada, but the hardware you have today from like three years ago could still work for just a lab environment. And you know, maybe it's all you've got and that's where you need to start. Um, so software is also going to be different. Are you, so like, 
Are you Windows? Are you Linux? Are you going to use a Mac? Um, that's something you need to think of. And then like also like what are the pieces are going to do? If you're doing like I know like malware analysis, maybe you want a cuckoo box and you want to set that up and do uh, malware analysis on that and or you know use Metasploit and pen test against different web locations or setting up you know insecure web locations so you can actually see what these attacks do. That's something you need to think about. And for home use, it's normally like personal goals um, that you yourself want to accomplish. Um, and when we go into the work goals, maybe a little different. Um, the other thing that you need to keep in mind is upkeep. So like power, heat, noise, all that stuff is something you need to keep in mind. And like if your server is like 10 year old, like this guy is, is he going to run 24 hours seven? And I mean, also patching and version updates and license costs. Um, and then this big one, do you need approvals from others in the house? Do you have a significant other? Does, you know, are they going to mind that there's this giant server sitting in the living room that's just going for like the whole day. They're trying to watch Netflix and all of a sudden it starts spinning up because you ran a job and now they have to turn the volume up and it's not fun. I've seen it happen at one of my friends' house. <laughs> it's actually quite hilarious. So the next part is the work lab. And if you think the slides look pretty slim, you're probably right because they have about the same goals. Do you have a budget? And if you have a budget, is it 10% less than what you actually requested from you know, your management? Because that's the cool thing to do is you ask for X number of dollars, upper management's like, well, you know, we don't really want to spend all that money. You know what, 10% less than that. And that's what you get. And then on top of that, you, didn't, you, didn't, you definitely didn't order 10% more because you saw this coming. It was definitely, you, you got 10% less. Um, that may or may not be a server joke, sorry guys. <laughs> Um, again, what is the goal? So the difference between a home goal and a work goal is if you're doing this for work, this may be based on your team. This may be based on your department. This may be based on your whole company. Your whole company may depend on this lab working properly, being set up properly, and being able to accomplish what you think it will do. And like, is your company you know, selling healthcare software? Does your lab need to focus around that? Or is your, health, or is your company based on creating a video game, or is it you know, cloud-based applications, all that stuff will monitor what your goal should be for your lab, especially when focused around security. You're wanting to secure not only just your company and your team, but you're also wanting your team to learn. So it can't just be like, oh, it's just going to automate everything and you know, someone else is going to do it. You want your team to get stronger. You want you to get stronger. You want your whole company to get stronger based on what your lab is going to do. Um, and it goes down the same list as home. Um, is it possible to use what you have? Do you guys have a tech refresh for a larger company? It's like every three years you chuck out your old systems and you get new ones in and you know maybe smaller ones you may not do a tech refresh or you may try to do a tech refresh but maybe that old hardware that you're not using or new hardware you're not using because the project died and you're like hey can we use this for a lab and upgrade down the total cost of what I actually need to get this topic running. It's something to keep in mind. It's something you should leverage every chance you get. Because if you just have servers sitting, you know, in boxes, well, what good are they going to do? Might as well try to utilize them to improve yourself, your team, and you know, the company. Um, software will also be different. What's the cost of software? Are you going to just stick to open source free stuff for your lab, or are you going to be able to get like super cool, high-end, several thousand dollars worth of software for just your lab? Um, maybe some people call it non-prod and make it you know, match prod so you actually have a place where you can do full testing on what an attacker would see if they physically try to go after your prod environment without you know, risking your prod environment every day for some you know, random stuff that you might try to attempt to see like, hey, is this going to work? The system might go down, but because this is our lab, we don't care. Um, again, upkeep, are these servers need to be on all the time? Or are they just going to be sitting in like, your boss's office sitting in a corner with a like, single wire going up to the closet. Um, or will they have a dedicated data center just like your normal instance? Well, most companies would have a normal instance like dedicated data center or, you know, a closet, you know, right next to the broom and the mop and all that stuff. Um, and then again, do you need approvals from others? Most likely, yes. You can't just bring in random hardware and start stepping it up and then, you know, all of a sudden, you know, HR is talking like, what's all this extra equipment? And um, it's making a lot of noise. Um, 
no one can you know get work done because your servers are just buzzing away and uh, it's a real mess. So getting approval is probably a good idea, um, especially for work. So what should you actually use? Um, this will go into the point of like, will you be using an actual just like physical hardware versus like VMs where you just spin them up on like a hypervisor or, you know, super cool thing is using containers now with Docker or, you know, using someone else's computer or aka the cloud because if, you know, Amazon wants to host your security lab, that's great. That would be fine, right guys? Everyone sets up security stuff in the cloud with no repercussions and no legal issues at all. That, I mean, that's what I do. I don't know about you guys. Um, again, and then once we go into that, like what OS are you going to use? Linux, Windows, Mac, you know, BSD. You know, FreeBSD for PFSense is pretty awesome. Um, but like you know, AIX, HUX, maybe you have an old server HUX system that can't, you can't get rid of because it has this critical application. And you want to make sure it's secure and you can't actually make it secure because it's got to do X, Y, Z. And, who knows? Well, you know, Clear OS, I hear, is making a comeback. Actually, who has heard of Clear OS before? Man, not as many as I thought, but it's a, it's a doozy, I tell you what. One of my old managers made me set one up. You know, that was just a few years ago, so it was already dead by that time. Um, so going on that, like, what types of software you use? Again, going on, like, what exactly are you wanting to accomplish? Are you doing, like, web application testing? Are you going to do your... Malware, engine, uh, malware, reverse engineering, or are you going to um, just do like specific admin stuff and doing testings of like, um, like what systems do what, what, uh, what ports are active, just simple stuff like simple program testing, um, and then version properly, aka patch level matters. So, for example, again malware sampling. If you have a malware and like you see a Windows device get infected on your network and you want to test it in your lab. You may not have to use, like, the if you try to use a fully patched Windows system in your lab, you're like, oh, it doesn't work. So this was just a fluke when it was actually two versions old and none of your laptops are actually up to the fully patched version in your work network. So, um, so that's just something to keep in mind um, when you're looking at stuff. And other things like different versions are supported for your license uh, software. So is this version even, you know, applicable anymore? Um, is it so old that this company won't even talk to you about it? And why is it in my lab, and why are we still using a prod? That's something else you got to keep in mind as well. Um, but clearly, everyone will just go to use Watson, and we won't need any labs. Watson will solve everything for us. Um, they'll sync DNAs, and you know, it'll be great. Because actually, yeah, just put in your order for Watson. You don't even need to go to this talk anymore. Talk over, guys. That was easier than I thought. Um, but we'll go into like where to get your stuff as well. So how many of you have been on a site called eBay? <laughs> Not as many as like, you're lying to me now. <laughs> um, so eBay is a good spot. Uh, but there's also a new site. Have, has anyone heard of Lab, Lab Gopher? No one? Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a neat little site. It'll actually, you know, look at the eBay list listings for you. You basically search for a server type, and it'll tell you like which ones are good deals and which ones are bad based on RAM, the CPU in it. And I haven't used it personally, and I just discovered it like two weeks ago. Um, and I haven't needed server equipment between two weeks ago and now, as you can tell. So it's, um, it's something to keep in mind, but I would leverage that if you're looking for actual real server hardware. And then you can actually use eBay. Um, Another place, Micro Center. If you just need like a Raspberry Pi to get stuff done, it's like you're setting up like a DNS, uh, was it Pi, Pi Hole, I believe it's called? Yep. So set that up. You just need a Raspberry Pi to do that, and that thing is amazing. Um, and then Craigslist is another big one for servers. That's actually where I got this guy, the big one from, was a Craigslist ad a long time ago, and he actually sold me a server rack as well with the server and it was like 75 bucks for the like, server and I bought like three of them and then the server rack was another 50 bucks and it's like 10 foot high and it's sitting in my friend's basement because I live in an apartment. <laughs> this was back when I lived in Illinois. So it was, uh, but yeah, Craigslist can have a lot of good deals. 
Um, you just gotta know what you're looking for because if you start looking for servers, you're gonna get these like dining sets as well. Um, and as cool as like stainless steel and silver dining sets are, when you're looking for actual you know hardware, keep that in mind. Um, your basement, if you have old hardware that you're not using anymore, um, you'd be surprised. Maybe you're like, oh yeah, I forgot about that. And you could use that. Probably not the best solution because if it's in your basement, it's probably been there a while, or you already know why it's in your basement. It's because it's broken and you've already stripped it for parts. <laughs> so keep that in mind. Um, another site, has anyone heard of Reddit? <laughs> What's that? It's this, it's, it's this one website that people go to and they complain to each other about stuff. <laughs> There's one good section on Homelab, and if you think what I have is crazy, just go to Homelab and look at some of their stuff. Actually, I'll go to another one. Um, data Hoarders, you, man, they've got some crazy, crazy, crazy stuff. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit, but Homelab is actually a really great resource. They have a wiki on their page, and I've thought about just copying that and making that my talk and just using their wiki. Um, it probably would have been 10 times better than my actual talk that I'm giving now. So after this talk and you're all disappointed, go to Reddit uh, Home Lab and look at their wiki and be amazed at all the stuff you're gonna learn from them. Um, another thing, I keep saying that a lot by the way, sorry guys, I just realized that. Uh, you can repurpose equipment. Again, you have stuff lying around, servers you're not using, both home and work, and just use them. Um, as long as they, you know, fit into the, the area that you want them to and they won't, like, break the bank with power and heat and noise. So just some keep in mind. Um, and then Setcasely has a Slack channel. Has anyone been to the Setcasely Slack channel? Yeah. Uh, there is actually a channel, which you may not have known, called the Black Market. And it's KC Black Market, and people actually sell random stuff there all the time. Um, and sometimes they give it away, sometimes it's, you know, hey, I got this, what will you give me? Sometimes it's, it's another good reference, especially if you're local. Um, and another thing is Ikea. Um, and you may not believe it, but Ikea sells these things called uh, black racks. And they're not designed, they're actually just coffee tables. But you can get something, and if you want to, you could Google or Bing, you know, search a lap rack, and you'll find people that put equipment on these, like, cheap, really, really cheap, um, like, coffee tables. But they're the perfect size to fit, you know, a one U system, or multiple use system, like switches and routers and the, the, rack, the rack mountable items. Um, in fact, Here's some two pictures that I found, and I would not recommend doing the one on the right because that's probably above your head um, there, and that is a lot of weight on those systems. And as much as I trust IKEA stuff, I don't know if I trust IKEA stuff for that much, <laughs> especially especially with children on the fence. And I mean, yeah, even if you mount them, I wouldn't do it, guys. But like the one on the left is probably pushing it a little bit as well, but that's what people do, and you know what, for an entry-level system, if you don't have a huge budget and you don't want to just have your equipment lying around, they work. And that's what I first used, was just a simple black rack. They're like eight bucks for the small one, and then there's a longer one that's like a coffee table, and it's, I think, 25 bucks. It's, you know, it works, because um, it's just the perfect length to like set your equipment in, and it sits there, um, and it's, I mean, for the price, it's nice. So while you're looking around for your equipment as well, another thing to keep in mind is to pay attention to specs and not titles or cat pictures. And by the way, this is the mandatory cat picture for this talk. So I've met that quota. Um, so when you report this in to the talk police, say he had a cat picture, he's fine. <laughs> the other thing to keep in mind, this is a real picture from a real eBay listing. And this guy really does take pictures of his servers with his cats. And he's got a great rating. But you have to pay attention to what you're buying, and you can't let your heart go out because they have a puppy or a baby or some cute thing with their servers that's completely empty, doesn't have anything, is missing RAM, no CPUs, and they're trying to sell for $600. Not saying that this guy's doing it, but the price was probably a little higher than it should have been from what I saw. Uh, but he also sold the system, so it works. Uh, 
He also has a Twitter account. So keep that in mind, marketing guys. Um, when you're also looking for your equipment, if you're looking on eBay or something, um, make sure, like I said, pay attention to specs, what's in the system, what's not in the system. Like, you'll see a system like this that has, looks like it's full of drives and full of stuff. And you read the description, they'll say it right there. Please read the description first, the info. It's, the picture is just another random picture of the server, a stock image. And then you'll see no drive, no drive sleds, which can range from like 10 bucks a piece to like 30 bucks a piece. And if you have like an 8 bay server, either you stick your drives in and like kind of like put like cardboard in between them. I don't know this from experience, by the way, but you put cardboard in between just so they slide in correctly and then hope nothing touches the server while you're, you know, you're using it because if something bumps and one of the drives comes out or two of the drives come out or three of the drives come out and your RAID dies, and you're just trying to figure out what happened and you notice like some of your drives are tilted the wrong way. It's bad times. And like I said, that $15 or $30 per drive adds up quickly. So if you're wanting to fill up eight bays times 15, is anyone good with math? Eight, eight times 15? 120. See, extra 120 dollars. What could, like, could you get a better spec system with drive trays or maybe even with hard drives for 120 more than what like, this thing was asking? So, Keep that in mind, also how much RAM is coming in the system, and if it actually comes with drives. Um, most of them do, they'll either come with like one drive, and sometimes it's like a, maybe a terabyte, but maybe like a three, like 320 gig drive, and they're not actually like SAS drives or SATA drives. And, um, the other cool thing they do is put virtualized like eight times in the title. So you know this server can be used with virtualization, and they'll be like, New da, 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 virtualization, virtualization, da, 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 use it for your virtualization system. Now, I'm not kidding. I've seen seen posts like that, and it's really annoying. But they want you to buy it because they want they know you want to use it for virtualization stuff. So, uh, <laughs> yep. The other thing you can't forget is networking. You're like, all right, I got this new server. We're gonna put stuff on it. And now, how do I connect you to other servers and systems and the internet? And, oh, right. <laughs> Um, so when you're looking for equipment, you're like, do you, is it just going to be like a single instance and you're just going to plug it into your home router and hope that it doesn't actually take down your network when you're trying to end map scan a segment and you didn't put in the right, you know, address and you actually start pinging and destroying your whole home network and now the kids and their family can't get on to Netflix and now you're getting yelled at and it's just not Or are you going to have like specific equipment set up and you're going to do VLANs because VLANs have all the problems, especially for these work systems. If you VLAN something, something off, you're just, you won't, you won't even have to worry about it anymore because there's no way you're going to screw that up either. You're not going to like accidentally, you know, start hitting your prod network because you networked wrong. So it's something to keep in mind. Um, and when you're looking for home stuff, it depends on, again, what your end goal. Do you want to get better at networking? Get some, you know, real Cisco switches and routers, or um, my favorite is Ubiquity. I actually have a Ubiquity AP, and I use it for my wireless network, and I try to connect my IoT devices too, because I don't trust them at all, and everyone else should too, because Alexa is always listening. In fact, there's a talk next door about Alexa <laughs> listening. <laughs> FYI. Um, and so, on top of that, there are actually, you know, who, who's heard of PFSense? Perfect. It, it's an awesome tool. It's another system you can spin up. You can spin up as a VM or you put it on a physical device, and that can be your, your networking device that you use. And then for switches, when you're looking at switches, make sure you pay attention to specs. A lot of older switches are 10100, although probably not as much anymore. Um, but it's something just to keep in mind that if you're running gigabit speeds, maybe it's not a big deal. Maybe you don't care if it's 10100 because you're just using an old Raspberry Pi and you don't need pure gigabit speeds. But when you start transferring larger data, so like when you're transferring your rainbow tables or your Linux ISOs around, it may take time. So it's just something to keep in mind when you're setting this up. Um, again, for networking equipment, uh, pay attention to like if it's a managed device where you have to set everything up specifically, you have to set the routing, you have to set this all that stuff, or if it's just a non-manage where you just plug it in and it works. Um, by the way, I love those, and because you just plug in stuff and it works, 
because I'm lazy and I don't remember networking anymore because I don't do it anymore. Uh, I still have a basic managed switch, but I don't get into it as much as I probably could. Um, but it's something to keep in mind if you really do have to segment off your network from other networks because of you know, security concerns. Um, also, cloud-based networking. Who, who's dealt with AWS before? Who's heard about AWS buckets being open on the internet? Keep it in mind when you're setting up your own lab um, to like test out like what makes this bucket open to the internet and what makes this bucket close. If you do AWS stuff, that's a good way to test. You can scan your own stuff and be like, hey, this bucket's closed, this bucket's open. What did I do differently between these systems? And that way you can actually help set up, you know, in the future, you can actually secure these AWS systems so we don't see them in the news every two weeks by the same guy who keeps finding this stuff every two weeks. Um, and like I mentioned before, but Ubiquity is an awesome, simple to use, you can almost plug and play to get to work. Um, but you, it has a lot of customized settings you can do. The APs are like 70, 80 bucks a piece. And then all you need to do is like set up a, you can set up a VM for their actual, you know, the controller is the word I was looking for and uh, set up the AP completely and, and piece of cake. Actually, you could probably set it up on just the basic Windows device now that I think about yeah, it. Yeah, you don't need a VM for it. Yeah, you don't need a VM for the software now. Sweet. You have to install Java with it. Oh, <laughs> so you want to set it up on a VM. Because <laughs> <laughs> Java. Ah, power. So we'll go over power because it's actually a big piece to what you're doing for your lab. Work is probably not as important because you're in a data center and your lab probably isn't a major milestone, but it may be something to keep in mind whether you're going to keep old equipment around or new equipment to bring in. Um, so basic setup, I have an old a TS440 I got a few years ago and it works fairly well. It's going to be um, my storage server in a little bit. Um, it's down for commission because it got replaced by this because this one uses a lot less power. Um, and as you can see, it used, just plugged in, it was using about 5 watts. Um, and then turned on 105 watts. It had about 4 disks in the drives. Um, for this guy, when he's turned on with the server off, so I've got like a switch, the AP, a Raspberry Pi, and a couple of other devices plugged into this. When he's turned on, he used 23 watts. And then when I turn on my server, which is a little tiny 1U system, it's a Supermicro SYS E200, um, and it only jumped to 6570. That's running with like five VMs and setting networking and doing a bunch of stuff. It's got like two little SSDs in it, so super low power for what you're getting. Um, and then for this old server that I got a few years ago, um, I turned him on last night to make sure he did still turn on, and he does. And hopefully he'll turn on right now. We'll plug it in fully. You can do that to roughly monthly cost. <laughs> it depends on where you're at. Um, But uh, I should have done the math for that now that you say it. That would have been cool. I think when I did it before, it's like the top one ends up being almost 10 or $15 a month. For and I think that's because that's, I'm kind of like you setting up the home server. And that's why when you go with like those super micros and they're packed with power, yeah. I mean, it adds up. spending $7 a month instead of $15 a month in power over 12 months. It sort of does hurt that. Yeah, it adds up real quick. and. This guy, you, can you guys hear him? What? He's, he's my quietest of all the servers I had because I had like a 4U server that was super loud and then a couple 1Us that were those like rocket engines like they just stay that way and it's awful. But this guy, he's running about 196, 195 and he's not doing anything. I just turned him on. He's not running any software. He's not running any applications and he's around 200 watts. So he's almost double of what the old server was. Turned on about four disks, he was running a few things as well. Um, but like I said, this guy's about 10 years old. But again, double that $15, and now you're talking about $30 a month. And that's even, that just adds up a ton. And this guy, he, he's, like I said, bought him a long time ago. Um, and he's noisy, really noisy. 
and after a while you just get annoying and you're like, okay, maybe I won't use you anymore. Your job's ah. not <laughs> But another thing to keep in mind with these old servers is how many of you guys have seen a SCSI drive before? Yeah. So make sure that the stuff you're buying is fairly current and it has either SATA or SAS. Because um, that way you can at least get normal, I call them normal hard drives in them. Because once you start getting super old and they're super cheap, but these, this drive is 73 gigs, but it's a 10K, so it's super fast. Um, still slower than SSDs now, so it's a mute, mute, mute point, I guess would say. But it's something to keep in mind when you're looking at equipment that a lot of this stuff that may be cheaper may also be louder. It's the same for networking equipment. Networking equipment is notorious for being super loud. Um, so like, if you're thinking like, oh, I'll just put this new Cisco switch that I got in your words. Do you guys hear me still fine? Yep. A little, little better? Go ahead. Um, so when you decide to like, oh, I'm just gonna stick this in the bedroom because I, I love the white noise. And then you're like, this is really loud. I don't like this anymore. <laughs> Um, that also wasn't me, I promise. Um, but it's, it's something to keep in mind. And when you, and we'll go back to that slide where it's like, how long is this going to be on? Are you just going to turn this on occasionally, like when you want to do your lab stuff? A few hours a day, maybe on a weekend. Maybe it's not a big deal then to like save a few hundred dollars just get an older server, because it'll do what you want. Or, but if this thing needs to be on like 24-7, and like you want it up all the time so you can run long testing and doing stuff like that. You, you've got to keep that in mind because it will add up quickly for either home or work. Um, so like your job, your work doesn't have an unlimited budget for power. Um, but again, it may be a drop in a bucket for larger companies, but for small ones, it will definitely matter. But then again, if you're just doing like a few Raspberry Pis, then it's no big deal. Of course, while we're talking about power, you know, why don't you just make your lab pay for itself and be like, yeah, I need all those GPUs for, uh, you know, rainbow tables and, you know, hash cracking and stuff like that. And then during the off time, you're not cracking passwords. You can just, you know, do some Ethereum mining, Bitcoin mining. Um, what are some other cryptocurrencies that are hot today? Sexy coin. Oh, yeah, the sec KC coin. <laughs> Sexy coin, definitely. Got to mind that all the time. Dogecoin never goes out of style. I've, I've got a bunch of Dogecoin, actually. Yes, you should. <laughs> and everyone else should as well, because Dogecoin is definitely not, you know, dropped and unsupported anymore. It still exists. Charlie coin is coming up. Is it? <laughs> That's the first time I've heard that. So... Um, but this is something else, like, are you actually going to use your lab for more password cracking um, for both, you know, work and lab? And then while we're going on just password cracking, who can forget, you know, rainbow tables? And then having a lot of storage. And we'll go to data orders and see what they have for their storage. And then you see these people with, you know, you're like, oh, a few terabytes, and their terabyte is going to double digits, triple digits. And they're talking petabytes. And this is just for their home. They're not talking about, you know, you know, big work environments. They're talking about their home and all the Linux ISOs that they legally have and downloaded to hold all the storage. Petabytes of data. I am serious. It is it is impressive, some of the equipment they have. Um, but it's something else to keep in mind on what you're using. I wouldn't use any of these drives because I think these are old, like IDE drives for laptops. Does anyone want to correct me on that if I'm wrong? Sure, absolutely I see right. you're correct, yeah. So, um, but keep in mind, like, for storage, like, going for your lab, what are you going to use it for, and what you're doing. But another key piece is, like, what's the big thing that's going on right now with uh, in the malware world for security? Ransomware. What does ransomware do? It encrypts storage stuff. So when you're setting up your lab, and you're wanting to test stuff, different things, you might hit a piece of ransomware. Well, what's one thing you don't want that piece of ransomware to do? Spread and wipe out all your storage. So if you're at a work environment and they're like, oh yeah, you can just use our normal SAN for the VMs you're spinning up, be it, they'll be networked off, segmented off. There's no way they're going to get to the prod data and completely encrypts the whole prod SAN. It's, it's a risk, and honestly, I wouldn't want to risk it. Um, same for your home network. You don't want to like 
set off a time bomb of some kind of ransomware in your home network and then have your, all your machines in your network caught with a little message saying, please pay us so many bitcoins if you want to see your home network. Because um, apparently I went to a workshop with hospitals yesterday and they're just going to double the amount and then eventually set off bombs in the city. Yeah, that's, that's what the workshop was yesterday. It was quite interesting. Um, I recommend if they do it again next year to go to it because it was, a, it was quite an interesting workshop for sure. But back to storage, check data orders if you really need a massive amount of storage and how to set up like a NAS, a SAN, just for your own use. Um, and keep in what, what, for whatever you're going to use, but make sure it's, you know, segmented off if you're using network storage because sometimes you're just, you know, going to ruin everyone's life if you're not careful. So, XKCD, who has seen this comic before? Mm. It, is, uh, it is a good one, and it is one of my favorites. Um, if anyone wants to do this, let me know, and we can team up and try to put this together for next year's B-Sides. And we'll have a TV, and we'll show little viruses running around, and then, like, they'll escape the network and hit wherever it's being hosted. <laughs> and it'll be great. Great fun, right, guys? Um, and I also hit the mandatory XKCD talk slide limit, so again, once you talk to the talk police and tell them I passed that check as well. But some things that you'll need to keep in mind, like what exactly are you going to do with your security lab? Um, who, okay, actually let me ask, who has a security lab already and that they're using today? What are some things that you do? You, yes. VMware Fusion, 
and so it becomes that way. Then you go to the hypervisor system with like ESXi and Proxmox and Hyper-V. Who's actually who's used Hyper-V? Oh, good, good. I I've tried and it just didn't work out for me. Um, I may need to keep digging and learn it a little better than I do now. Um, another thing you should have, and this is coming from just experience, like. You should have a log aggregation system to keep track of all the stuff in your environment. So like Splunk, Elk, Graylog would be good systems to set up. And just like if you're doing something on this environment and this network, maybe you want to have all your logging from all your devices go to a centralized point. So you're like, all right, well I did this to this device. Let me go to my log aggregation system to see what exactly happened. And then you can go through the logs and just in one little place and look at it. Also, if you're in a work environment, you might want to make sure if you're testing different malware to see if the malware behaves differently if there's a log aggregator on there or if there's not. Because some will see a Splunk system running and they'll do XYZ instead of ABC. And they'll change their behavior patterns because they know that if they just blast away the logs locally, which is what they're planning to do, you're still going to get it because you have a system set up. Others may actually check to see if they can modify the configs for you know Splunk, for instance. And, um, change it so it's not looking at that system, wipes it during the time and brings it back up so you don't know and you're still aggregating. But that's something you, because you should have control of the full system, you can see what's happening to your environment and why you set up a lab in the first place, is to give it a sterile environment so you know what's going on what's happening. Um, and so you can see the full scope of what is actually changing. Um, also, like. The cool thing about these log is they can also have the networking devices. Is your IPS getting set off? Is your IDS setting off? Stuff like that. And it's just one single location. Um, I think it should be in every kind of lab, just because it'll help up give you a better picture of what you have. Um, so let's take a look. See at my notes. This is actually okay. The other thing I want to mention: if you want to do basic, I don't know if it'd be web testing, but like if you don't want to do anything, but you just kind of want to like go to the <coughs> test the sites, just over the wired out work. And it's been a long time since I've been there. I need to go back and play through those again. But they're just basic web front end stuff that you can test stuff out. You don't need like a full blown, you know, Linux Kali system up and running 24 seven to like do these simple tasks. Um, and it'll help you get started and find out whether it's for you or it's not. So. So using the internet is basically what I'm saying, guys, <laughs> to find what you can. So I mentioned this earlier. I gave a talk, or I didn't give a talk. I gave, sent out a survey for people for this talk to see what they had in their labs. Um, it was only out for like a week. If you didn't see it, I only posted it in a few places. Um, it was basically a test run. Um, I'm hoping to do another survey, which will be a little more widespread. And then I'll basically be writing a white paper with, with my professor on home labbing and with security and other you know varieties of home labs and you know do whatever white papers do because I've never wrote one but my professor has and I'm gonna talk to him and be like hey because it was his idea so it should be fun but like I said I sent this out I had about 20 people respond um, a bunch of my friends tried to respond and they're like I have no idea what you're asking and they're not technical at all um, so I'm like okay I gotta make sure I post this in like channels that I know people will understand it because if I don't it just leaves a bunch of blank surveys and was about 10 of those so I had like 30 total responses but like 10 of them were completely blank I'm like well, these are probably all my friends that clicked on it and didn't bother doing anything um, because they just messaged me and they're like what is this um, but what I saw was about most of them were home labs there were a couple that did it for work um, and work specific stuff and most of them were to train their teams and train themselves on different stuff. Um, the big one was like setting up a malware VM and then infecting it and then seeing what happens. Um, others were like, um, no, go back slide. All right. Um, most of them also used um, ESXi and Zen server for the hypervisor. There were a few that said they had a couple like physicals, and one of them basically mentioned the only reason why they had physicals lying around was again for malware sampling to see if it reacted differently on a physical 
hard server compared to a VM because they notice sometimes the malware will, be will behave differently depending on what it affects. If it affects a physical device or if it affects a VM. Um, others were, oh man, come on. Sorry, I keep putting the arrow keys on my laptop and it just flips to the next slide instead of scrolling like I should. Okay, I don't know why I wrote that in my notes. I'll figure it out later. Um, but again, most of them are using it for that. Some are using it, it is biased because I also ask people in my company. A lot of them are using it for uh, setting up Splunk instances. And they were basically setting up basically Splunk Enterprise for security and testing different things out for themselves and for the company I work for. But my company has a bunch of Splunk consultants, so that's a little biased. But I'm sure everywhere else they probably do similar things with like software they're familiar with, with maybe a vendor they're specific with as well. Um, and I've seen that with a couple other people. I, I assume they responded from like SecKC because I shared the link there as well. Um, but like I also mentioned, I will be sending out another survey, hopefully in a couple weeks. Um, I'm going to try to spread out. I will actually have a sign-up sheet up here if you guys want to give me your email address, which is totally cool to do at a security conference. <laughs> <laughs> You can trust me, um, and I'll eventually send out a survey link and remind you why you're getting this email from me. And it'll be from my personal Gmail account. Um, but again, we already went through this part. Was uh, What are you guys using? Um, are you guys using like physicals or using VMs? The ones that have labs already? Not everyone at once. R710. Yeah, R710, that's the big one now. Uh, see, I got a, a Intel Nuke i5. Yeah. So it's the dual channel RAM. So I have 32 gigs, and so it's using VMware. 2900 is the big one. Because so one thing I got when I was starting this up for my storage was HP, the HP Micro servers, like the HP 50L. They were like fire selling them for like 100. It's 150 bucks a piece, and it's like a four bay hot swap drive, and it's a little mini server with a little atom processor. And um, I put a system called Synology, or Synology, which is a clone of Synology, which is basically plug and play, simple, and that's my Plex server. And I've actually got two of them, so one's a Plex server, one's my you know, storage, and I've got a few terabytes of storage there for all my Linux sites, those guys. <laughs> you gotta, gotta make sure you keep sharing them out as well. Seeding, seeding your Linux sizes so other people can download them. That's important. And a VPN. Um, a good VPN. Um, so, but the one thing, and I mentioned my little HP microservice because HP has a system called ILO, so you can remotely manage your server. But they also made it to where now you can't download your any firmware updates unless you have like a support contract with them. So if you're just a home labber and you don't have a full support contract with with HP, you can't update your firmware, and if you can't update your firmware, you're like, oh, who cares, but then you're like, but I kind of want this feature, and now I can't do it because I don't have a support contract, and pay attention to your vendors you're buying from, is basically what I'm saying, and then seeing what their rule sets are. Um, also, if you also haven't noticed, because of Bitcoins, um, you know, GPU prices have went up a lot. And all hardware prices are actually kind of high. RAM is stupid high. And I don't know why RAM is so high, except I blame the cryptocurrency. But does anyone have a real reason why RAM is so high? Because I'd love to hear it. Cell phones. Oh, cell phones. Yeah, that makes sense. The little, God, good old cell phones. It really is partially cryptocurrency. Running a pool is a rather resource intensive mm -hmm. task, not the mining itself. Yeah, that's cool true. Operators. Crypto pools. Yeah. You're taking up a lot of memory supporting all of those connections. Yep. Um, another thing to keep in mind is uh, to see, one, to make sure your actual, if you're looking for old hardware, to make sure your CPU actually supports virtualization. It should, but there's a chance that it doesn't. And I would just want to make sure, like, if you're looking at hardware, you don't just buy something specifically for virtualization, and you find out that you can't actually virtualize anything on it, because that's awful, and that has happened with my friends before. Not me, because I've always done the check. 
because my friends got burned. Well, so I know it, it says over there just for a second. But uh, it happens. Um, final thoughts. Um, again, just going over what I said before. Keep license in check whenever you're planning out your lab, setting it up. Open source versus closed source um, is what you're actually going to do with accounting using your lab. Um, hardware hacking can be pretty big as well. Um, so like if you want to do different hardware pieces, that may be a part of your lab. So like if you guys saw the first keynote about car hacking, his lab may, you know, probably contains a car or at least pieces of a car. So what you're looking into, what you're wanting to do, keep that in mind as well. Um, and like stay to your budget and stuff like that. Um, also here's a cyber kill chain. Um, is this still a thing? Cyber kill chain? I hear this has to be in every single security talk. Um, and I just want to make sure that you guys know that here's the cyber kill chain. It has nothing to do with this talk, except that you should have a poster of the cyber kill chain to round out your actual security labs. If you don't have a poster of the cyber kill chain sitting on your wall in your lab, it's not a real security lab. You have to mention that it came from Lockheed Martin. Yes, you do have to do that as well. He's dating himself too, because everyone knows the cool thing now is the Mitra attack model. Oh, I'm so, I'm so far behind. So now you know how to make your own cloud. And you know where you can get your copy of Ubuntu 3. Uh, let's give him a round of applause, guys. We've got some time for questions. Shameless plug for SecKC, because we're rad as hell. Questions? How do you deal with network interfaces on uh, Ubuntu versus Linux? Like, you're talking about your current server. I just... Um... Do you have enough physical for what you need? Yeah, basically on my Supermicro, I can I can just network to the DSXI host on it, and then I actually have a VM spun up with Hyper or not Hyper V, um, VM vSphere. I actually bought the vSphere like license deal that they have, like a yearly program where you get like a bunch of different VM for license for like three hundred bucks. So I just set up a vSphere center on there, and I could just get to that. So I don't do any hardware based stuff on the micro the actual micro server now. If I do, I just use the VGA. So, but most of it just spins up and automatically spins up the beams for me. So, also, our sponsors, because they're awesome. Woo. And this is the same slide as all the others, but please let me know how I did. If this was a terrible talk, I want to know so I can be better, because I'll probably talk again next year, because I talked last year, and if people are just getting the same boring talk over and over again, or I talk too fast, or I say um, or what was my word that I kept saying over and over again. If I keep doing that over and over again every year, it's just going to be awful. So please, let me know how I did so I can be better and give better talks that aren't terrible. Uh, thank you, guys. All right, so we've got about five minutes until Bradford is ready to give his talk on